Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to talk about some joint work um, with um, Martin Dindosh and some very recent work with uh, Martin and Junggang Lee, who's uh, Tamarkin here at Brown on solvability for boundary value problems for complex coefficient equations and also for systems. And I, you know, this subject you know, has been worked on, not maybe necessarily the complex uh, case, but certainly these kinds of elliptic equations, the work has been done in this area for decades. The questions, the, it can get quite technical quite quickly. I'm gonna try to, to, to not get too technical, but at least to say enough to give you a flavor for some of the ideas that are involved in this. And in particular, I wanna focus on a fairly recent condition called P-ellipticity that applies to complex matrices or applies to the matrix of matrices that appear in systems, because it's an interesting condition that was sort of jointly discovered by others and so has already um, yielded some really interesting results in the area. And now I realize I'm going to be talking about some equations that um, people haven't thought too much about necessarily. So I wanted to give some warm up stuff about harmonic functions. And I know that many people here are, are very familiar with the theory of harmonic functions, but let me just put it in a certain context so that we can jump to equations with a divergence form structure more generally. So, you know, for a harmonic function, right? I wanna write this as um, in divergence form, kind of pedantically with a matrix in here, which is the identity matrix. And so, so uh, how, if you wanna solve, um, find a harmonic function, say in the upper half space with prescribed boundary data, F on the boundary, right? We're looking at the solvability of this in Rn plus with U equals F on the boundary, then there's actually, you know, because of the symmetries of the domain and the operator, there's actually a closed formula for, for doing this. So we can actually write down the solution as a function of a point x, t in our domain at, explicitly in terms of the Poisson kernel, right? So this is the convolution of f with this Poisson kernel. And we think of this expression here as a measure that lives on the boundary, one for every point x, t in the domain. And now one of the things about this, um, about this uh, expression is that in fact, it is bounded by the Hardy-Littlewood maximal function of f at any point x prime where x prime has a non-tangential cone that contains the point x t. And so that means that if I take, if I take the soup of the values of u that range over a cone, a non-tangential maximal, non-tangential region associated with this point, that the LP norm of this expression is bounded by the LP norm of F for all P's between one and infinity. And that, including infinity, that's what I mean by solving a Dirichlet problem with data and LP, finding a solution with this a priori bound on this expression, which is called the non-tangential maximal function of F. And what this bound a priori tells you is that the solution converges to, to the boundary values almost everywhere, if, as long as they are restricted to, to points in a non-tangential region. Now, from the point of view of harmonic functions in certain domains, it's very easy to solve these problems because you can write down the, you can write down the expressions explicitly. If, on the other hand, you're looking to solve a, a boundary value problem, even for Laplacian in a different domain, you run into very, you run into some very different problems because you don't have explicit solutions. 
So for example, I suppose you wanted to solve a boundary value problem for Laplace's equation, but this time not in a, in a uh, domain, um, in a domain like the upper half space, but a domain above the graph of some function. Let's label that function phi of x. Well, one natural thing you might do is, is take this problem, which exists in this maybe not so very nice domain, and map the domain using some change of variable to another nice domain, let's say the upper half space. And in that case, your, your harmonic function u will be mapped to a function v, and the v will no longer be harmonic but it will satisfy an equation with similar structure. It will be a divergence form equation with a matrix A, which is not the identity, but depends on the Jacobian of this transformation. So the matrix A depending has, you know, depends on the Jacobian of the transformation. And so it's going to depend on how good this function phi is. And it could be just bounded and measurable but it will still have some structure and that structure is called ellipticity. So, what I, so there are many ways actually of landing in this, in this area where you're studying divergence form uh, elliptic equations with bounded measurable coefficients. And let me just um, emphasize that, that this condition of ellipticity means that, that this form is positive def strongly positive definite. So that's the that's the ellipticity condition, the thing that's preserved by that change of variable. Now um, we have to define what we mean by a solution to such equations since when we take the divergence, if the matrix A has coefficients that are not differentiable, we're not going to actually try to take those, those derivatives. So a solution is defined weakly as an element of a Sobolev space. And what we mean by a solution is if we were able to just express this as an integration by parts, right? So this is our analog of integrating LU against phi, which we express by integration by parts with this, with this um, integral, which now you see makes perfect sense as long as U belongs to the Sobolev space. So this is what it means essentially for U to be a weak solution. And what we know about weak solutions goes back to this, this groundbreaking work of De Georgi and Nash and Moser in the 50s and 60s, who proved that every weak solution, even when the coefficients of the matrix are only bounded and measurable, that, that, that the, um, that the uh, solutions are actually um, held or continuous of some order. So we have, we have not every property, of course, that harmonic functions have, but we have a collection of really important properties that these solutions share with harmonic functions. A maximum principle, interior Helder continuity, a Harnack principle, uh, which means that the infimum and the supremum will be comparable in a, in a compact subset of the domain with constants that only depend on the domain and not on which solution you have. And we have, um, we can represent the solutions in terms of a representing family of measures like our Poisson kernel, but we just don't have explicit, we just don't have explicit solutions that we can write down, but we know that we can represent the, the solution as an integral against a measure. So we have all kinds of tools to deal with, with solvability of boundary value problems we look at the measures, we look at these, um, <clears throat> and we look at the, the Green's function when the, so when the uh, coefficients are real value. But we don't have this necessarily in the case when the matrix is complex valued. So none of these things hold for solutions to complex equations. We don't have maximum principles. We don't have, we don't have continuity. We don't have, of any sort. And so there's now a whole lot more that's going on in the case of complex coefficients. So I, what I want to do it really pretty quickly is turn to some, some work in the case of complex coefficients and maybe first motivate that with some 
places where this, these coefficients have already been considered and work has been done. So, so some results in the complex setting take place under the assumption that solutions to L satisfy already those things that we know about real valued solutions, namely this so-called de Georgie Nash Moser bounds, right? And so, you know, you might be given a complex matrix and say, assume that it satisfies the de Georgie Nash Moser bounds, then here's what we can say about this. But, but that's a sort of unsatisfying assumption because there's no direct way, there's no structural condition on the matrix that tells you that under these circumstances, we have this de Georgie Nash Moser theory. There is other work, however, that does focus on structural assumptions for the operator, things that are checkable in terms of looking at the matrix. And one of the most, um, one of the most famous examples of this is the solvability of what came to be known after it was reformulated by uh, Macintosh as the Cato conjecture for complex valued divergence form equations. Okay, so, so our ellipticity condition for complex equations looks like this. So we, this is the complex inner product, but we take the real part and we demand that that be strongly positive definite and also bounded from above, which is um, not necessarily something <clears throat> that it's also something that we have to impose. So, so this is the ellipticity, this, this uh, condition on, on um, L. And then the question that was um, posed by um, first Cato, but then really had to be reformulated by Macintosh to make more precise, um, has to do with the square root of this operator, right? So the question is, what is the domain of the square root, which comes down to asking, can you prove an estimate like this? on the square root of L as an operator, is this an L2 and is that bounded by the L2 norm of the gradient of F? So the homogeneity is right. L is the second order operator. So square root of L is a first order differential operator. And this was open for decades before this was solved in the early 2000s and brought in a lot of new sort of techniques and even, even more questions into this theory. So just a, a quick aside for, um, on, on this, uh, on, on how that was solved and how this particular boundary value problem was attacked. So the estimate on the square root of L um, is equivalent to solving a boundary value problem. So I really want to relate this back to the issue of solving boundary value problems and why you know, one might be interested in them. So L is our, is our, um, is our operator. And uh, we actually create a new operator in one dimension higher by forming this matrix A tilde. So our new operator is L tilde, and that is divergence A tilde gradient. Okay, so if you look at the structure of A tilde, you see that this operator really has the form dt squared plus L divergence A gradient. And this gradient is just in the X variable. And A only has a dependence on X. It has no dependence on this T variable because it came from a matrix in one dimension lower. So the boundary value problem in question that has to be solved has to do with the solution to E to the T times square root of L. And the answer, and so what happens is that, that what we're looking at is a boundary value problem for an operator with a specific structure, namely the, this block structure and also this independence of the T dimension. So, so I, I simply wanted to emphasize the fact that under certain structural assumptions, it is possible to, to solve a certain kind of, of boundary value problem. And maybe I should go back and say that, um, that when you're looking at the solutions to this operator, what you need is, so this, this U of XT being this expression 
is a solution to this equation. You can see this formally. And what you need to do is solve this. You need, what you need to do is prove some properties of the solution of this equation. OK, so, so a structural condition on a matrix can lead to, to solvability of a collection of boundary values problems, which in turn can lead to solutions to other equations. And now I want to introduce some, some work that Chaldea and Mazia did in around 2005 and 2006. So in a series of papers, they, um, they defined a notion that they called LP dissipativity. And this was motivated by trying to understand these, um, this particular semigroup, which is the heat semigroup, right, for this second order elliptic operator, not the, not the Poisson semigroup, which would have the square root of L in there. So they wanted to understand when um, <clears throat> the solution, when these semigroups are contractive in LP. It's a question that, that is always, it's all, the answer to that question is always when the second order operators are real, but it is a question for complex coefficient operators. And they formulated a, a, a structural condition on matrices, which, um, in 2016-17, Martin Dindosh and I reformulated in a stronger way and, and, and looked at the following condition on matrices. So this is a condition on a complex matrix. This inner product down here is the complex inner product. And so this is, a, this is the condition that I want to, to focus on, which has come up in, in, other, in other ways as well. So the matrix is a matrix A with complex coefficients, we'll say is p-elliptic if we have a relationship between this bound mu of A which is now something just as so structural, just associated with the matrix A, something presumably one can check if you're given a specific matrix. And this quantity in here, one minus two over P. Okay, so there's a couple of things I wanna say about this. The first thing is that um, if you take, um, if you, instead of P, if you were to put P prime, where P prime is the index that's conjugate to P, you would find that one minus two over P prime has the same absolute value as one over two, as one minus two over P. And so it turns out that there's, there's, um, there's some symmetry in this condition between an index between a, a number P and its conjugate index P prime. And so that's going to be important to us. Now, the condition on P ellipticity was um, formulated independently and, and, and almost at exactly the same time that this, their paper appeared on an archive as, as this paper by Martin and I. It's by Carbonaro and Dragicevic. And, and in fact, they, turn, they, they used the term P ellipticity, so which <laughs> we, we immediately started borrowing that term. And so, for p bigger than one, here's, here's their definition of p ellipticity. We're going to define a linear map uh, in the following way. So p and p prime are conjugate indices. And Carbonaro and Dragicevic show that the matrix is p elliptic in the sense of, right, in the sense of this definition if and only if this condition holds. So this condition, you know, sort of structurally looks uh, a lot more like the ellipticity condition, except that this inner product is with this other form. So the advantage of the expression in, in terms of mu of A that I wrote down before, this one, one, 
minus two over P less than mu of A. And mu of A being an expression that you get when you compare, uh, essentially compare the real part of A and the imaginary part of A in some, in some sense, in certain terms of the quadratic form. The advantage inter of this separation is that it shows that if A is elliptic, you know, the, that it's actually, if A is P elliptic, it's actually P elliptic in a range, right? Once it's P elliptic, it's P prime elliptic, and it will be P el Q elliptic all in between. So, so P ellipticity is a range. And, and moreover, um, when P is equal to two, it's pretty easy to see that for that for p equals two, we're just going to get ellipticity back again because then alpha and beta are divided by the same thing, and this becomes the usual p ellipt you know, two ellipticity condition. So p ellipticity is truly a generalization of two ellipticity, and and it also sort of sort of spreads the range of ellipticity. Okay, so. So we, I think I've said everything I want to say on this page. So we have P being elliptic in a range. And when P is equal to, we have the usual ellipticity condition. OK, so that's, that's the condition that we want to work with. Let me just tell you very briefly what Carbonaro and Dragicevic were interested in, which is an entirely different problem, but still shows that this P ellipticity condition was the right one to solve their problem. They too were looking at a problem having to do with the heat semigroup associated with this complex matrix and this complex divergence form um, operator. And they wanted to obtain this, this bound with constants depend dimension free, with constants depending on ellipticity parameters. So um, there has been some previous work in the case when A equals B and when A and B are real. And so this they had they had obtained and in fact um, some sharp control on P in, in the real case earlier, or at least Dragicevich and Goldberg had. So the so the idea is that P ellipticity was the right thing to solve this particular problem in the complex case. Now um, so what do we do with P ellipticity? Well, I want to, to point out a couple, I want to state a theorem, but then I really don't want you to look so carefully at it. I want to try to explain what's going on. Um, so we have a P elliptic matrix and uh, we're going to prove a couple of things about solutions to this, to this um, uh, ma divergence form equation with this matrix this matrix being uh, still complex valued. All right, so now our weak solutions have, are in W12. They're, they have a gradient in L2. So the solution itself has some integrability. Of course, it's in L2, but it's actually a little bit better because of the Sobolev embedding. So we have some integrability on, L, on, on, this, on our solutions. But beyond that, you know, this, is, this is the, we don't have any particular higher integrability on solutions. Now, back to, to, to Georgie Nash Moser, one of the ways that Moser reproved this to Georgie and Nash result on, on, um, max, on, on Helder continuity and maximum principles was through a, a technique um, of iteration. So sort of getting there in a sort of step-by-step -step process, increasing the integrability of the solution and using that increased regularity and in solution to bootstrap up to the next step. And, and essentially that's, that's what we're going to be able to do under the condition of P ellipticity to, to get a little bit better integrability and, and sort of bootstrap, use the sort of Moser iteration technique, but only up to the threshold of, of where the operator is P elliptic or perhaps a little bit beyond because of this kind of Sobolev embedding improvement. So what we prove is that if the matrix is, is P elliptic, then actually the solution is, is integrable with a higher power Q 
it goes well past two and and just a little past the 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 point at which the matrix is p elliptic and what we're proving is that that this higher integrability obtains because we have what's called a reverse helder condition on on solutions u The second thing that's being proved here is a, a higher regularity condition, namely that that this that this expression u, which is essentially u to the p over two, belongs to w one two. So so the p ellipticity gives us higher regularity on the one hand and higher integrability of the solution on the other hand, not all the way up to L infinity. We cannot conclude that our solutions are bounded, satisfy a maximum principle, et cetera. And the main, the main way that P ellipticity is used is in an estimate that, that, um, that takes the following form. So, so here you see this expression that it occurred on the left-hand side of this inequality here. And how are we going to, to use this? How does this relate back to the equation? Well, it relates back to the equation because we can express this as something that has to do with the matrix in here. And let's take a look at this back in the case for just ellipticity when p is equal to two. When p is equal to two, this is just basically the usual expression with a grad u grad u in here. And over here on the left-hand side, we would have the gradient of u squared. And you see that this is just really an application of, of ellipticity to the complex matrix A. And so what we're saying is that when, when we look at p ellipticity, we can get a similar kind of expression involving the matrix A and our expression over here, which is grad u squared u to the p minus two. So why is an expression like this useful? Well, once you've introduced A grad u, you've introduced the equation. And so you've introduced the ability to integrate by parts and to get back to the boundary and so forth. So this turns out to be sort of this sort of main, main point in some sense of what the p ellipticity condition gives you. And, and if you go back to the papers of Chaldea and Mazia, you'll see expressions that look like this in their paper where they were proving that this had a sign. And what our p ellipticity condition allows us to do is to is to strengthen the 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 inequalities that are in some in this work of Chalde and Mazia and relate it back to expressions that we that we want to be able to to integrate essentially. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about what the implications of this are for boundary value problems. And in order to do that, I want to introduce um, a further strengthening of this of this um, theorem that um, uh, we, we found in a paper of Fenoy, Meberoda, and Zhao. So let me just go back one more time to this result. So we have we have this expression, and this is how this holds on. So we this holds on an interior ball, right? Here's our domain, and here's our interior ball that has radius r, distance r to, to r to the boundary. And so this is all interior estimates. So these are all interior balls on the boundary. What Fenoy, Mebroda, and Zhao did was extend some of these same regularity estimates to the boundary. Actually, they did this in the context of, of some interesting um, uh, questions about um, lower dimensional boundaries and, and degenerate operators. So they, they sort of took this p ellipticity condition and, and, and really extended it in other ways. But I, I don't have time to, to talk too much about that. Let me just, um, let me just say what, what, they, what they realized could go all the way to the boundary. 
So, so the picture here is, you know, you have a domain omega and this, this B intersect omega is a, you know, a region uh, close to the boundary. And in this region, what we're assuming is that our, our solution, our solution is zero here. You know, formally it's trace is zero, but you know, well, let's, let's just um, not worry too much about some of the technicalities. So we have a solution which is zero here. And now we're gonna look at these expressions inside, but, but now on a ball that's on the boundary. And we're gonna be able to say, we're gonna be able to get the same sort of natural um, expressions. You know, this, this thing, you know, if gradient of u was really like u over the distance, we would get another two powers of u with the r, with the another two powers of u with the r squared there. And here is our reverse Helder inequality, but it's now valid, you know, right up to, to the to the boundary of the of the domain. And this turns out to be a really important extension for some some results that 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 Martin Dindosh and I were able to establish later. So now we have this interior regularity and we have an analog of this for boundary regularity. And all of this is under the assumption of being, you know, p-elliptic or q-elliptic. Okay, so, so one of the things we were able to, to, to do, which I, I wanted to explain a little bit more in the context of, of systems, which I'm going to try to spend a little bit of time on, is uh, using this boundary regularity, and you know, and a theorem that was um, it, it, it's really a valuable theorem in this in, in that it's general real variable result applied to this that was observed um, independently by O'Shea and by Shen. We we can prove um, what's called the next we you know, an extrapolation result for the Dirichlet boundary value problem. Okay, so, so pay, pay no attention to the fact that this is uh, stated for chord arc domains. For those who know, we can get below the sort of geometric uh, conditions on the boundary, which are maybe more natural in this case, like you think of a Lipschitz domain or something, but just forget, you know, I'm not going to go into to this definition. So that, you know, don't, don't worry about what a chord arc domain is. Just think of omega as a domain in Rn. The, these coefficients right now are still only assumed to be bounded and measurable. So that for all intents and purposes right now, this should, this need only be, um, be a, you know, a ball or a, the upper half space. So what we want to know, what we want to, we want to consider, we want to consider the Dirichlet problem for a complex valued function. And as I said, that's going to involve proving a, a, um, a, a non-tangential estimate for our, our, our solution, an a priori LP inequality. The data is in LP. So if the data is in LP, we want to be able to say that the non-tangential maximal function is in LP. And remember, we defined the non-tangential maximal function as the soup of the values of U, where U, uh, where the points lay in a non-tangential region over X. But we're not going to be able to quite say that for complex valued coefficients, because, for, because in our case, our, so here's the here's the LP inequality we want, but we're not going to be able to define our non-tangential maximal function quite the same way because we can't define the values of our solution point-wise. Right, this, our solution is a an LP or LQ function. It's not. It doesn't have point-wise values. So we have to be a little more careful about how we define our non-tangential maximal function in order to, e to get the sort of non-tangential convergence to the boundary. So instead of, instead of taking, you probably don't want to look at all that stuff, just let me draw a picture. So instead of taking, um, instead of taking our point-wise values in the cone, we fix a point xt, and instead of evaluating you there, we just draw a ball that has this as a center, of radius r, where this distance is roughly r, and we average the function 
over this ball. And that's what that is. And so we're replacing point-wise values by averages because we have to. Okay, so, so what we prove is again, a theorem that, okay, so here it is stated explicitly and I'm happy to share my slides with anybody who wants or um, a, a after this, this talk so you can see the explicit expression here, but basically I think maybe I'll just try to explain it with a picture. So what this theorem says is that, suppose you have one of these complex, um, you have one of these complex matrices and the matrix A is, you know, P elliptic and it's P elliptic in a range, right? If it's P elliptic, it's P elliptic in a range. So we have some range where this is P naught prime and P naught and it's, and let's put, it's always two elliptic because, <clears throat> and it's, so it's, a, so it's P elliptic in this whole range. And now suppose that somewhere in this range, we know that we can solve the, the LP Dirichlet problem. Right, right, at some particular, at some particular point. It could be L2. That's often where, that's often where you actually have some information, maybe L2. And then the extrapolation theorem says, as long as it's P elliptic, you can actually get solvability of the Dirichlet problem in this whole range and actually a little bit beyond. And so, and so that's really the, what's, what's written here with, with all this uh, notation, just that if it's solvable at some point, it's, it's, it spreads. And so, so that, you know, this is a, this is a phenomenon for real matrices that you take for granted, you know, because of the maximum principle, right? If you've got a real matrix and, and you know that you can solve like the LP Dirichlet problem at some point P, well, then you also know that you have solvability in L infinity by the maximum principle. The Dirichlet problem, that's, that's a, the, solving the L infinity Dirichlet problem is, is a weak version of the maximum principle. And so for real matrices, in the real case, you know, you always get to extrapolate the solvability of the Dirichlet problem, at least in one direction. Okay, so now I wanna, um, I wanna leave a little bit of time to say a few things about systems. So a complex coefficient equation is also a skew-symmetric system of real real system of equations by looking at the equations that the real and imaginary parts of U satisfy. And so, and so what we're now going to consider is P ellipticity for systems, you know, even for real systems, you know, because even in the case of real systems, you know, we don't, we don't have the tools that we have for elliptic equations. We don't have maximum principles. We don't have Helder continuity, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's, there's this, this issue of lack of tools, you know, you know, inspires one to look for structural conditions under which you can solve some of these boundary value problems. And so we can formulate, so the, the second, let me just you know, back up and talk about what, kind, what the general form of these systems are. So, so here's how you sort of generally write a system of equations. Uh, second order system of equations, and he, we, you know, might have some some lower order terms. So we're going to allow for that. And, and in the case of systems of equations, there are at least three different concepts of sort of classical ellipticity. So in the first place, there's a strong ellipticity condition, and it's expressed this way. This is um, looks pretty pretty like a familiar um, version of the ellipticity for second order equations. And um, it's usually referred to as the genre condition. And if you integrate that, you know, you'll get an integral condition, which, you know, is therefore a little weaker, but also 
harder to work with and to verify. And, and the weakest condition of ellipticity for classical ellipticity for systems is called Legendre Hadamard. And that's when this C is allowed to be, um, is allowed to have some more structure and satisfies this condition. So there's sort of these three different conditions. And what we, what we did <clears throat> with um, Dindosh and Zhanggang Li is we introduced sort of analogous P ellipticity condition for complex, the analogous for complex equations um, for systems. And, and it, it's this coincides with exactly what you would get for P ellipticity for complex equations if you regarded them as a real elliptic system. And we have proven um, sort of the analogous relationships between strong integral Legendre Hadamard P ellipticity conditions as holds under the two ellipticity conditions. And interestingly, you know, we also can prove this extrapolation of the Dirichlet problem under these conditions. So here, just to give you a flavor of what the condition looks like, strong P ellipticity looks like this. And here, this, this um, notation, inter we introduce some new notation in here. So this C of omega is, has this, this definition. And again, you see that when P is equal to two, when P is equal to two, this just um, goes away. And we have, um, we have a kind of strong, uh, we, we have the usual um, uh, Legendre strong ellipticity condition. So for P equals two, again, it coincides with Legendre classical P ellipticity. And then, uh, so we also formulate an integral version of this, and we formulate a Legendre Hadamard version of this. And, you know, we apply, we apply, um, we apply this to a couple of classical systems, including the, the Lame system of elasticity. So let me just take the last four or five minutes to say a few things about the Lame system and what we get from that by applying this, this structural condition or trying to understand when it holds and what that might tell us about solvability of the Dirichlet problem. So here's the Lame system. And if we write, um, if we write this um, in the general tensor form, you know, we're looking at um, an equation where this, these are our coefficients. Now, interestingly, um, we can write this equation in several different ways. And in, uh, in a paper of Dindo, Shuang, and Mitreya, that under certain natural assumptions on the Lame coefficients, which are not necessarily continuity, the, 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 the corresponding or differentiability, the corresponding LP Dirichlet problem was shown to be solvable for, for P actually P near two, right? So this is basically P near two. And in their paper, they relied on the fact that this equation can be written in multiple ways. And to be precise, for some auxiliary function R of X, this equation, this thing, that I, <clears throat> I guess I didn't detect this twice. And this equation can be written, um, this equation can be written in this fashion where you introduce this parameter R. And the point of introducing this parameter R is that when you formulate ellipticity or more generally P ellipticity, the parameter R plays a role. So when P is equal to two, it turns out that A of R satisfies this Legendre Hadamard property um, when mu is positive and lambda is bigger than minus two mu. This is a reference to Brown and Mitrea. And moreover, um, this uh, matrix is strongly elliptic when R has, you know, satisfies these conditions. So the aim is to choose an optimal R to ensure P ellipticity and therefore to extrapolate the solvability of the Dirichlet problem from L2 to the entire range of P ellipticity. So 
that was the objective. And so for sufficient conditions, we, we worked on verifying strong ellipticity. We wanted to find the largest range of P such that, and now here's our, here's our matrix P ellipticity condition written out specifically for LAME. And we wanted to show that this was larger than, than this. So this is the kind of optimization problem we, were, uh, we, would, we tried to find. In other words, we have a choice of R here. And so we're trying to find the best R that makes for the largest range of P. So fixing the point X and relabeling these parameters um, in this way. So just to make this notation just a little bit simpler, the condition ended up looking like this. And so there's, you know, I know you're you know, staring at a lot of um, uh, a lot of notation right at first, but I just want to give you a sense of the kind of optimization problem that goes into this. So in in any effect, uh, we arrive at a result to the effect that well, this expression has to be big has to be bounded by some constant that depends on n depends on the parameter lambda, it depends on the parameter u, and we actually have an exact expression when n is equal to two. So let me just say that, for example, one of the conclusions we can draw is that when lambda over mu is in this range, then that implies that the range of solvability when dimension two is actually an infinite, which is, was known. So in other words, we can solve in the whole range and we can do better than certain results that were, that were known already, even, even when under assumptions of, um, even under stronger assumptions than solvability of the Dirichlet problem. So for example, the range when dimension is four is bigger than eight. So, so the, the sort of moral of the story is that the, the P ellipticity condition tells us some interesting things about, um, about solvability of the Dirichlet problem, not just for complex equations, but also for systems. And, and this is just sort of the beginning of, of exploring what's going on with systems. And there are a number of, of open questions that that uh, that remain, and you know this extrapolation of the Dirichlet problem is is um, sort of just one boundary value problem that one might consider for equations like this. A lot less is known about regularity or Neumann problems. All right, I think I'm just about out of time, so I will stop here. I left a little blank page for questions, but I also have some references to share, which um, after I um, tech this file one more time, I will be happy to share with, with people. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jill. Thank you very much. Let me express on the behalf of everyone who is still muted that we are really grateful. At this time, I think that everyone can unmute themselves and ask questions. I can ask a question. And can who's that? <laughs> uh, can anything be done for uh, quasi-linear equations in divergence form? I, I, I quasi-linear. So I, I haven't thought about that. Um, I maybe some colleagues that are on the line might have. Slide in our I'm sorry. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So again, I I don't have um, I don't have much to 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 say for for that. Um, but if if anybody else has uh, something to add to that, please do. So I will I, I will uh, say that um, this work of Fenoy, Mebroda, and Zhao um, 
Fala's work of um, Maybroda and 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 David um, and and others on some degenerate equations in um, with lower dimensional boundaries. So they're they're looking at a sort of lower dimensional boundary and trying to find an analog of harmonic measure or elliptic measure there and what they end up ex end up having to explore is a matrix that has a, a, a factor in it that that is that gives that's related to the distance to to the boundary of that to that lower dimensional boundary and that that gives rise to a degenerate equation so so in that context even they were able to to provide some new results uh, using p ellipticity Are there any other is, questions? Yes, this is Roman Schneider. And uh, you mentioned at the beginning that it is far away from what is being done at uh, Norbert Wiener Center. And uh, it is not uh, quite true because there is a book by Alessandra Lunardi. She's the uh, professor of uh, mathematics in Italy, I don't, I don't remember exactly at which city, who wrote a book about uh, uh, p electricity and uh, well applications of uh, interpolation theory in this very classical sense to uh, p electricity. I think it, it was more into classical case because we needed this book to uh, use certain certain techniques uh, in. Uh, Euclidean Jordan algebra regarding, uh, say, uh, restoring theorem. So that's what it is. It is some bridge. This is what I wanted to make comment. Oh, well, okay. So I I don't recall saying something was far from what was happening at the Norbert Wiener. Oh, maybe I understood it that way. <laughs> I certainly, yeah, I didn't mean to say that. I just uh, meant to to imply that that not everybody had you know was as familiar with certain issues and divergence form elliptic equations is, you know, uh -huh. um, but anyway, uh, I, I'm curious about your reference and would, would uh, love, it, love it if it, um, if you could email me with that or put it into the chat. Absolutely, absolutely, I will do it. Do okay, it. thanks very much. Thank you very much. I also want to add on behalf of the Norbert Wiener Center, if I may speak for it, that we feel we are very inclusive and in as time passes we would like to incorporate all areas of mathematics into, <laughs> into our interests are there any other questions no so i have been i have been to the Nor norbert wiener center and given a talk it's been it's been several years but i had um i had a tremendously great experience there and i'm really very um very pleased to be invited back and I thank you for your attention today. Thank you, thank you so much. We really appreciate yeah. your time, Jill. Uh, thank you for, for, for coming back to the Norbert Wiener Center again. Uh, thank you, Jill. Thank you. My pleasure.